Warning, this content is for entertainment and educational purposes only. This video is brought to you by First Detachment Nutrition. Battle tested, expert formulated. Use discount code AB10 at checkout for 10% off. All right, folks, Big Paul here today with the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only Dr. Mike Isriatel. What's going on, Dr. Mike? Oh, Paul, thanks so much for having me on, man. It's a pleasure to uh, to be chatting. Yeah, dude, I, I tell you what, you completely changed my, well, you and Dr. Schoenfeld completely changed my thoughts on training. I have tried every bro training method over the years, and I got back into lifting, I don't know, five years ago or so after a 10-year hiatus of being a fat ass and running businesses and having kids. Okay. And I, I tried to cha- train with the same bro intensity that I did when I was younger, and I just kept breaking myself. And I'm like, I got to figure something out. And I found your book. I think What is it? The, the uh, Fundamental Principles of Hypertrophy? Or yeah, scientific. Slaughtered- scientific. scientific. There yeah, you go. Pretty close. Thing and I be. read it. And I read it again, and then I watched your lecture series on YouTube, and I watched it again, and I'm like, this makes sense to me. I'm going to give this a try. And then, lo and behold, I started making progress again. Very cool. Was it the lecture series was Advanced Hypertrophy Concepts and Tools, or is it Hypertrophy Made Simple? I think it was, no, no, it was the advanced one. It seemed to line up pretty much one-to-one with the book. Yes, it was It was uh, made after the book, and it was made basically as a follow-along guide. 32 different videos for that, so it's a lot of stuff. You, I'm excited that you went through it. <laughs> you still have that. Not only did I go through it, I went through it twice. That was my cardio on prep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you learned a lot. It's still up on YouTube, always will be. So it's there for Yeah, that's for awesome. So anybody that hasn't picked that up, I'd suggest picking it up. Because I get a lot of guys that come at me and they're like, they're like well, I, that, that doesn't work. And I'm like, have you even read any of it? <laughs> oh, almost never. You know, uh, it, I, okay, fine, fuck it. I'll start. Is it okay if I swear or do you not like swearing? Yeah, you can swear all you want, man. So praise Satan. In any case, um, I have been really kind of fuming about this lately. I might as well fume on your podcast. Um, I don't really mean this. It's more funny than true, but it has a silver lining that I'm willing to step behind. And here's, here's my shit. There are lots of people that when anytime you say something remotely thoughtful, you're trying to figure things out in hypertrophy training, in dieting, shit, even in drug use, there is a group of people that seem to get really offended at the idea that something could be more complex than they thought it was. And they'll get in there and be like, stop fucking overcomplicating, man. It's just simple. Eat fucking, eat fucking food and lift weights. Really? Is that what Hani Rambod charges Phil Heath and all those other guys for? This is just to tell him just eat and lift. Well, I have a feeling he has something slightly more nuanced to tell them. And there's a lot of guys who just seem to like be burdened by having to think. And 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 here's my shit to them. First of all, you may be right. Some people overcomplicate things. Absolutely. But you have to eruditely actually tell them how they're overcomplicating it instead of just swiping the whole thing clean and saying just overcomplicating it like how do you know that you've never dealt with any of these concepts you can't even explain what this concept is how can you possibly say it's overcomplicating if you don't even understand it and here's my last point on this the people that are anti-intellectual anytime you put up a podcast clip or a snippet on instagram or say something smart i follow you. So I, and your, I see your comments quite a bit and this happens. This happens in mine all the time. It happens in yours as well. To the people that are going to say, just book it overcomplicated. Hey, hey guy, listen, shut the fuck up. And here's, I mean, something more specific. You think that lifting is all about putting food in your mouth and fucking lifting. Then shut the fuck <laughs> up and do that. Let the people who talk be the smart people that know things. It's crazy. It's like, you're coming into someone's shit like it, it's like if I was to go into some like break dancing practice and they're practicing all the break dancing moves and I'm like, you guys gotta cut that out, man. This shit is fucking lame. Like nobody invited you, motherfucker. You don't even know what's going on. Just walk away. <laughs> so when people like try to say, like, man, it's fucking overcomplicating it, listen, you're a fucking idiot. I get it. Just swing weights around at a gym. Don't say anything to anyone. Talking, it requires more intelligence than lifting weights, and you are walking fucking demonstration of that. You know what I'm saying, man? Like yeah, I, I can't imagine how incredibly, I mean, I, I, my background's in computer science 
and I, I, I studied computer science in college and that's what I've done my whole life. I've consulted people on technology and it's, this, it's the same way. Like when I try to talk with, <laughs> and they, they think they know more. I can't like the frustration when you have spent a good chunk of your life studying something in depth yes. and then you get some troglodyte telling you, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. I'm like, yeah. motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. Really? I love it. Yeah. And a lot of times it's like, they'll say that same shit where they're like, man, the pros had it all figured out 30 years ago. Really? I remember one guy was like, I posted something about the volume landmarks or some shit. Um, and, you know, like minimum effect of volume, maximum recoverable, that, that sort of thing. And this guy goes, Mike Menser had the volume landmarks figured out in the late 80s. And I was like, interesting. He never claimed they were titled that. And I remember, I believe my colleague, James Hoffman, and I actually developed them roughly five to 10 years ago. We were the first <laughs> people to develop them. We invented them. And he's like, I just mean like the general ideas. I was like, that's also false. Mike Menser only was aware of maybe maximum recoverable volume. And he had no idea minimum effective volume was a thing. It was like, stop trying to make up. What is it? The There's a thing that says like, try to simplify everything as much as you can and but make it no simpler than it can be made right. like if you have to explain computer science to someone and you're like all right there's a processor there's this chip there's a motherboard but they're like what about i just called it all a computer you're like yes that's nice but it's more complex <laughs> than that and i know these things confuse you but then just hire a coach or just shut up and lift it's it's crazy <laughs> like why would you debate when your ability to think is so hampered that there is no need for you to debate it? just go lift <laughs> Well, I mean, um, most people live below that that threshold for the Dunning Kruger line, you know, <laughs> where they're too stupid to even know they're stupid. Yeah, that's 100%. that's the conclusion conclusion I've come to. I mean, I mean, even even still, I I try to take a thirty thousand foot view of things and pull back from there, right? I mean, that's you have to look at the micro with the macro in mind. At least I think so. But I mean, still, there that doesn't mean. You know, you're in the airplane. There's a lot of complex parts that make that airplane fly. Physics, science, all this other stuff. You mean even at thirty thousand feet, right? So I don't know. It's a terrible and analogy, but it's a fine analogy. And your body's much more complex than an airplane. Orders right. of magnitude more complex than an airplane. And to me, this kind of just lift weights and and e thing is dope, but it's slightly out of place. When like you post something and people say that to some shit like that, or Brad Schoenfeld or myself, it's like, clearly we're aiming for a little bit higher than just be jacked. Like Paul, you left just jacked behind fucking generation ago. Your arms right. are the size of my legs. We're not trying to just get jacked. That's not that hard. Yeah. You eat protein and lift weights. You'll be plenty jacked. There's plenty of guys like that in the seventies. They were fucking big, sweet, slow clap. If you're trying to put your physique on stage, in the best possible condition, if you are scrounging for every pound of muscle, you're going to have to make it a little bit more complex. And that's not something you want to happen. It just happens. You know, like I've heard guys legitimately say, like, it doesn't matter what type of gear you use. It's all milligrams, bro. Look, really? You're going to step on stage running three grams of test nth? I want to see what that, I've done that before, before I knew anything. I had 20 it's pounds not, of body water on my fucking shit. You're man. not going to be happy with the result. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to have some muscle somewhere under there. Yeah. But it's like, and a lot of these guys who have, they have respect for the gear game being complicated for some reason. They're like, well, yeah, man, I pull out Winstrol, then I put an EQ, blah, blah. Like, well, you're a fucking scientist, man. But then you're like, hey, like, what about training? They're like, don't overcomplicate it, just move fucking steel. Oh, yeah, so wait. So you're overcomplicating pharmacology, but training you're not willing to go down. And these are also the same guys who give you shit for like, yeah, you're eating protein bars, you really ought to eat just whole foods like really i thought it was just eat protein and shut the fuck up and they're like well no man you got it really matters like really okay so so far diet matters a lot D drugs matter a lot but training doesn't matter and i have paul i have a suspicion why a lot of guys are, are like that they like to train like they like to train and i mean right. and by like i mean they physically get yes they get an emotional salience out of training the way they like they take an ownership to it it's their method of training and they don't want to have to do two things one give up or modify that style of training or to even contend with the idea in their own head with that little termite of an idea that says, Hey, maybe you could be doing this exercise differently. Maybe you could periodize differently. Maybe you could be doing better. And it's like, when do you not want to think of, could I be doing this better in the bedroom 
once you get in the bedroom with a nice girl that's consenting to it, you got to believe your own swag and think you're the fucking man. Otherwise, shit just doesn't <laughs> pop off. So don't second guess yourself in there. But in the gym, obviously, while you're training, don't second guess yourself. But between sets, on the ride home, on the way to the gym, in your spare time, don't you want to be like, hmm, I wonder if my training could be made a little bit more optimal rather than just like, fuck it. I like to train how I train. Come hell or high water. I don't give a fuck if my joints fall off my body tomorrow. This is how I'm going out. That shit is crazy to me. What, what do you think about that, man? I'm, I'm ranting to nowhere at this point. It baffles me because, like, I look at bodybuilders have to be the dumbest group of people in the gym. They, they <laughs> literally have I to didn't be say the, it. You said it. <laughs> they, they are. It, like, you look at power lifters. They train with a specific purpose. They have programmed training. They're they're working towards a peak for, for a competition. They periodize their training. Power lifters almost never train to failure. Because they find out real quick that shit doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> right the next and, week you're done yeah right and i'm like and but then here's the dummy bodybuilder over here just doing what the fuck ever man no thought put into it what whatsoever it just baffles me even crossfitters have a specific plan for their sport especially nowadays like you know it used to be uh, back when crossfit started out it was just total debauchery chaos nowadays the better crossfitters all have periodized plans and we work with a bunch of them at rp so like they're because the CrossFit Games has been popular for a long time, because the money and the sponsorships and the pride on the line is a big deal, yes. nobody's willy nillying that shit anymore. No, you have top no. 10 in the world, you got a coach, you got a plan. But the thing is, in bodybuilding, there's almost two sides to the sport, so to speak, or two sides to the culture. On the one side are the guys that compete. At, the, at their their highest possible level that they can, which for you and I is at the national level, for other folks is at the pro level, right? How many people do you know at the pro ranks that don't have a coach that handles at least their pharmacology? Nobody. These guys are all like by the book and they're like, they know their coach is a fucking nerd. They love that shit. They're like, I want this brainiac to fucking tell me what to take so I can be fucking jacked. Cause like, you know, you can be not so smart and do fine and eating basic food and training pharmacology. That's got an ology at the end of that shit. That's a science. Fuck that. I'm not trying to fuck with that. I don't know what any of these drugs mean. I need someone smart to explain to me how to do this. So there's that side. But then you have this, like many of the fans of bodybuilding are just like fucking bros. And then, you know, they get together, you know, those like, Paul, you ever read the steroid forums back in the day? Oh, uh, I was on them all the time. I was a mod. Man. There you go. Oh, okay. God. So I'm really I go really way back. <laughs> okay. So like to me, one of the craziest things about bro culture was when guys would ask about what gear to run, but based on the limitations of what they had on hand, my friend, do you not think that putting fucking steroids in your body is important enough of a decision that you could wait on long enough until you manage to get your dealer to send you what the fuck you needed versus just being like, you know, I got to start next week and all I have is D ball tabs and some fucking test 500. Here I go. It's, it's like, cause you remember people used to ask like, Hey, here's what I have on hand. How do I make this into a fat That's loss? How I went. You're like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Do you think Mr. Olympia does that? Ronnie's like, I would do better at this Olympia, but I didn't have any wind straw on hand. What? And that's what passes for like, that's just how these guys. So if you got a guy who takes whatever gear is available at the moment, do we really believe he's going to periodize his training or his diet? Fuck no. Well, that's why they all stay mediocre. They never progress past a certain point. You you can get to the intermediate gym bro bodybuilder level, but if you want to get past that, you have to start paying more attention to detail. Now, half the time, I can't even get the guys to do the basics. If, <laughs> if like when I when I'm coaching people, like if I can just get them to do the basics, I'm happy. But you know, yeah. I tell people get the ninety percent buttoned up before we worry about the ten percent. But the ten percent does matter when you get to a certain sure. level. Sure. Another thing that I think is really misunderstood in bodybuilding training periodization is like, you know, at RP, we talk a lot about stimulus to fatigue ratio, which sounds yeah. fucking sciencey, but all it's saying is, look, if you can use a specific kind of technique, pick the right kind of exercises with the right movement patterns, such that you get as much growth stimulus as you normally would, but with one third less weight, and in a way that hurts your joints less, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Because we can say that's only 10% of the equation. And in an acute sense, like three months or of growth, absolutely correct. But 
if you want to be in the game for long enough to grow as much muscle as you can, you got to be healthy a long time. Right. And Paul, how many guys do you know that have severely modified their lifting into suboptimal because their bodies are so fucked up from doing bro shit? They just can't do anything properly anymore. I love when people bring up Dorian Yates. I'm like, dude had to retire when he, I mean, granted, he won an Olympia. If you told me if I rip my bicep off the bone in exchange for an <laughs> Olympia title, I might yeah, sign up six. for that. <laughs> <laughs> I, might, I might sign up for that. But I mean, the yeah. guy was like 33, 34 when he retired. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he I mean, retired with almost every muscle in his body. Almost every major muscle was broken at that point. Like, and then you he had done it that, everything. That trained more intelligently, like Kamal. I mean, Kamal's in his fifties, and he's still competing in open. Here's what you won't see of Kamal, though. You won't see a hundred videos of him pulling crazy iron around the gym. You won't see him yelling and screaming and nope. doing half ranges of motion. As a matter of fact, a lot of remember Dexter Jackson. Um, he competed in bodybuilding successfully for like five generations or some shit yeah. like that. He retired in his fifties. He was on the Olympia stage. I didn't even know how many times it must've been like 20 or something. And he won the Mr. Olympia one year, Dexter Jackson. I remember learning very early, like in the early two thousands, when I started following bodybuilding, Ronnie, you wanted to see him train, bro. You wanted to see him fucking throw shit around. Johnny Jackson, you wanted to see him break shit. It was amazing. Branch was like a fucking bull in a china shop. It was amazing, yeah. super inspirational. I remember watching Dexter Jackson's training footage when I was like a, a young person, and I was like, eh, why? Because it was slow and controlled and normal. And guess what? It was not so fun to watch, not so exciting. But then Dexter lasted 20 fucking years. Everyone else yeah. broke into fucking pieces. Yeah, they broke into pieces. You're a jujitsu guy, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I've I've done jujitsu off and on, but like you, you know, from doing jujitsu, one of the things that you learn real quick is cost, the cost of energy expenditure or whatever you want. Oh, yeah. Managing how you execute so you can last. You know, is this this trying to pull this maneuver worth the cost of it right right yes when you're I have five minutes and 30 seconds more time in this match do i really want to blast away 90 percent of my energy doing some dumb shit right and it's the same that's the way i kind of thought it when you brought up the stimulus to fatigue ratio in the books i'm like fuck man that's this that's why, why didn't i think of this 30 years ago man it's the same thing in jujitsu in pretty much all japanese mar martial arts is it, using energy conserving energy you know, using somebody else's energy against them. It, it's a parallel concept, I guess. I don't know, but it just made sense to me. Like, why am I going to beat the shit out of myself with exercise A if I'm going to cause joint and connective tissue wear and tear, especially at my age? I tried to train like I, when I came back, I tried to train like I was when I was in my, in my. Can you tell me what that means? What, tell me about your training. How, how bad was it when you came back? What were you doing? What were the characteristics of the I training? I was doing the, the typical thing where I had to go to failure on every goddamn thing and do force reps. And it was deadlift squats, bench press right at the core of it, as heavy as I can fucking go be, beat the yep. shit out of myself. I was a pussy if I didn't leave everything on the floor. Yep. And did that make you enormous? No. <laughs> <laughs> it, I got bigger train in this. One. I had, to, I don't know if you saw the, you know, I'm not, I don't want to make this about myself, but I went from my first show back, which was three years ago. I went from 185 pounds to 240 this year is what I competed at. Holy crap. Yeah. I made the best progress in my life in my late forties. I think. <laughs> and the only thing I changed was my training. Everything wow. else is the same. So what, what did you, I'm curious now. What were the main things that you changed? Like if someone was like, Hey, someone was sitting on a plane next to you flying somewhere and they just talked up something. Cause they're like, what the fuck's wrong with your arms? Why are they so big? And then you had to tell them, what is the, what is it that you learn in training in your forties that really pays the dues? If they were like, Hey, I'm back in bodybuilding. I'm in my forties. I don't want to be an idiot. What are like three things you can tell me about training and how it should look? To really make sure I understand like what to do and what not to do. What do you think are the big things that they really got? Well, you? the number one thing I started thinking about, and we already talked about it, was the stimulus to fatigue ratio, or just even beyond that. Like, what is this? Is this exercise that I'm cho choosing to do? What is it costing me as far yeah. as joint and connective tissue wear and tear? If I blow myself out, like, like I have a bad back, so I've just come to the conclusion I really can't do from the floor 
deadlifts anymore. Sure. So I, f- I found other ways to do things. You know, maybe it's uh, SLDLs with dumbbells or, you know, controlling form better. But I, I thought about it like if I go into the gym, do an all out set and I can't train with 100 percent or whatever, the proper intensity to promote growth over the next six weeks, there's no point. I would have been better off choosing another exercise that I could have used and been back in the gym again in three or four days. Yeah. So I, I would say considering the cost of that exercise, what, it, what the joint and connective tissue wear and tear, the exercise costs, like I think I heard you talk about it in one of the videos, like if I blow myself out of the water with a heavy set of deadlifts at the beginning of my back workout, how good are my every systemic all my other, fatigue? Yeah. How good is everything else going to be in that workout? Yeah. Yeah. You just, at some point you spill enough emotions into one lift. You just don't have the psychological energy and drive to like really push hard on the other stuff. And then you have to ask the question to yourself is, am I showing off or am I actually growing muscle? Cause like, I know some guys train, I don't have a ton of problem with this, but it can be abused. Some guys will do like one top set, one drop set kind of training. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of what I used to do. Uh, totally. And there's not something specifically wrong with that, but it can be wrong. And the, it can be wrong is if you're so tired after one top set that you can't do another few top sets, maybe the technique or the movement is the wrong movement for you. Because when I like have my working weight on the leg press and I do one work set, I rest a little bit. My next work set goes at least as well from a mind muscle connection perspective, how my joints feel, how strong I feel, how big of a pump I get. I just want to kind of keep cranking on that machine for a while. And it's weird when people spill so much of their effort psychologically and systemically into one exercise, they can't do that. Like the whole start your back workout with deadlifts idea. It's not on paper the worst idea, but you got to ask some questions to yourself. Like after five sets of deadlifts, what do I have left? And if the answer is basically nothing, then you're just a power lifter doing deadlifts. You're not a bodybuilder anymore. You got to train your lats and all this other shit. You got at least one other exercise, some kind of vertical pulling movement, probably two other exercises to do. If you can't do them justice, why deadlift? And then I think guys get in their heads about it. And they're like, yeah, man, deadlift's like, you got to do the big three. And it's like, no, no, you don't. That was some bullshit somebody fed you. And then it's just this whole thing of ego. I remember just even a few years ago, I was talking to uh, my colleague, Jared Feather, IFBB pro, I might add. And uh, I was like, hey, like, what is some objective shit you think I could be doing better in my training? And he was like, stop squatting as much. And I was like, what? And he was like, dude, you squat a ton. You love the squat. Your technique's great. It makes for great videos. But the stimulus to fatigue ratio for you doesn't make sense anymore because you need over 500 pounds if it's a fresh exercise. And that's fucking stupid. He's like, do leg press first, then hack squat. And then you can squat. He's like, in half the time, why are you even warming up for the squat again? Instead of doing three sets of hack squats and two sets of high bar squats, just do four or five sets of hack squats, do your fucking leg curls and you're good. And Paul, to me, it was so tough to hear that. He's like, squatting is my spirit exercise, man. I love doing it. I'm good at it. It feels, it's like almost like ASMR. Like it feels good to do. When I'm in the bottom of a squat, I feel so fucking cozy down there. And he was like, you know, it just doesn't make sense in the technical qualities. Dude, I swallowed it. I started squatting less. Didn't, it was awful to admit, right? I'm on fucking radio right now. Admitting I'm squatting less, doing more light press and more hack squats. I might as well get a fucking vagina installed on my forehead and call it a fucking day. But guess what happened, man? my fucking legs grew bigger and the rest of my body grew bigger because I wasn't as tired from squatting anymore. My back workouts went better because my back was stronger for my back days. And then all of a sudden it's like, why didn't I do this sooner? And the reason is a lot of fucking dogma and ego, you know, like must do lifts and shit like that. I still had that running through me. Yeah. And you see, it's funny because you see even minus the science. And this is what I tell dudes like, all the guys at the top level of the pro game now, they independently come to the same conclusion anyway. They all get there. <laughs> How many times? <top laughs> or or the ones guys? that don't, they break. Yeah, for sure. There's a huge, okay, so just to call us out, there is something 
called the survivor bias or survivorship bias. And uh, people just don't know about it a lot. And so I think it, it just behooves me to say what it is. It is the logical fallacy of examining only the success stories of a certain thing and then concluding this thing is successful. And the survivorship bias in, Im imagine something absurd like survivorship bias in World War II. You survey every single person who came back as an American yeah. soldier for World War II and you ask, hey, was combat like deadly to you? And they're like, no. And they're like, oh my God, everyone in combat does just fine. Well, you didn't survey the dead guys, motherfucker. And it's like, right, okay, I thought we missed somebody. Same idea is you look at top pro bodybuilders, almost none of them do the big three. And listen, I got nothing against the big three. It's just as you become bigger and stronger, these are no longer the highest SFR exercises, typically squat, bench, yep. and deadlift. Most pros don't do them at the elite level. And you think like, oh, is there something special or blah, blah, blah. Well, these are the guys that are left over. Some of these people just got lucky and there's not this some of them are wise and they know why they're not doing the shit anymore, but some of them are just the guys who, who made the switch arbitrarily. And that's why they're still around yeah. because the guys who said, fuck that big three all the way, they got torn fucking labrums and bad backs. They don't compete anymore. And then dude, I've literally had like, we all get old. We all fucking shrivel up eventually, but I've had older dudes that don't fucking look jacked anymore brag to me about how hard they went back in the day and all these fuck pussies nowadays using machines. It was all fucking slag iron when I was lifting. And I just want to be like, motherfucker, I can tell, dude, you limping at your age 62. What the fuck is wrong with you? And the reason is they never gave up. You have probably ever see people like um do knee wraps for the leg press. Yeah. I've seen people use it on bench press. <laughs> what? wrap their elbows up in with oh yeah hell yeah, yeah. because you gotta keep benching doesn't matter how bad it's fucking up your elbows fuck it i had a, a friend of mine who's an exercise physiologist and i remember like this is one of my knucklehead things that like i was telling him that my elbows hurt from doing skull crushers what can i do for it and he's like don't do fucking skull crushers <laughs> <laughs> no way man <laughs> Yeah, I mean, some of it, the guys on stage are just lucky. You're, you're right. They just they just lucked into it. But it is um, it, it is important to look at the people that have, why they're not there too, why they never made it yeah. there. Yes. Very important. Yes. It's yes. the same thing with the with the PED use too. I, that's another area that rabbit hole I go down to. The guys, Please, that, let's throw, do it. The, the guys that throw the kitchen sink at it early on, I mean, it's it's a long game you have to play play it smart and if you're throwing the kitchen sink at it day one where where you're not going to make it long enough to accumulate that sort of size yeah i remember i was running like anywhere between half a gram and a gram of gear depending on the phase for a few years and i read an article about like um one of the pros i forget who it was maybe victor martinez or some shit back in the day and he didn't know if he was going to be able to do a certain show because he had to run blood work. So his coach would tell him if he's even healthy enough to do the show. <laughs> and I was like, I am clearly not at that level of gear use <laughs> where like, you know, after uh, what I would call a gnarly cycle, like my AST ALT would be elevated by three points each. And then two weeks later, they'd be down to baseline. <laughs> oh, and that was that's it. Normal. Like, <laughs> right. And, and and we're talking about people that push it so hard that they have to take two or three months completely off of everything after a series of shows, which listen, if that makes sense for you and you're good with it, dope. You're all, we're all free humans. You know what I'm saying? America's great. Freedom is the shit. Do your thing. To me, maybe a little bit of a, not tragedy, but a bit of an unfortunate thing is I'm going to build you an archetype, Paul, of a type of person that I have met a few times. Young, top five national level guy in the NPC who gets those stars in his eyes, hires a big time pro coach. There are two types of big time pro coaches. One are relatively responsible people. 
two, as you well know, I'm sure, are people that have no problem putting you into a fucking rocket and shooting you into the goddamn moon. Like, you're going to take whatever you need to in order to do that. These younger guys who have that theoretical pro potential, that's where I've seen some of the most comical that's cycles. Where the craziest shit happens. Do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, oh, 100%. What have you seen? I'm just curious at this point. (laughs) Oh, I've seen some crazy stuff, man. I mean, I, (laughs) I mean, there is a time to mash the gas pedal down and a compound choice matters to, I mean, there's way, there's a big difference between running a gram of trend and a gram of prima bowling, right? (laughs) You could say that. (laughs) Right. right. So compound choice matters. I, I, the way I, the way I do it and the way I see that works the best is just to stick with the safer stuff in the off season. Yep. push those doses up as appropriate relative to your your skill level as a bodybuilder if you're 165 pounds you don't need to be running grams of gear if yeah. you're 270 280 you might need to that's yeah. just just where you're at but keep the keep keep the toxic stuff for contest prep when you need it my my thought process is and i work with some really smart people when it comes to this stuff is if you're going to run something that is toxic, it better provide some unique benefit that you cannot get from something safer. Like I, I see dudes just randomly running orals in the off season, things like Anadrol or, or D bar or whatever. And I'm like, why you just ask them why, why, what, what, what does that do uniquely better than you couldn't do with like say Prima Bowl and a testosterone or growth hormone. Okay. Okay. And they can't, they can't answer that question. I've got a fucking great story about this. So, Jeez, it must have been seven years ago or something at this point, six or seven years ago. I did my first consult with Broderick Chavez, Team Evil GSP. Yeah, Broderick's a smart guy. Yeah. And he was kind of like, I was like, tell me about your model. Tell me about what you know about drugs. And I was shit testing him, of course, in the background based on how much science he got wrong. He didn't get any wrong, so that was great. But one of the things he was doing was when I was asking him for how theoretical, like what are the pounds of muscle someone could expect to gain running this kind of cycle that you recommend? How would it look? How would it feel? And he was like stepping around this thing that I ended up sort of calling him out on. I was like, what, what does this mean here? What are you stepping around? Here's what he was stepping around. He was trying to tell me in the most ginger way possible that if I ran a test base and a cycle consisting mostly of Prima Bolin or Masteron or something like that, that I wasn't going to put on 20 pounds of stuff within a few weeks, but I was going to put on like five pounds of stuff over a few months, but it was all going to be actual contractile tissue, like real muscle. And remember he like, he took him forever to actually say this. And he was saying it as if it was going to offend me or it's going to cause controversy. And I was like, yeah, that seems great and obvious. I don't understand why it sort of took you this long to spit it out. And he was like, well, okay, now that we're on the same page, he's like, I've had guys quit on consult calls, quit in consult relationships, quit coaching because you tell them, listen, this whole front loading D ball in your cycle shit, this putting EQ and fucking DECA and EQ and DECA and EQ and DECA so that you feel like a fucking water balloon. So you can tell people I weighed 310 pounds on my last off season, that shit doesn't actually give you any more long-term tissue than the low side effect stuff that just works in the background. He's like, but guys can, many guys can't take it. They, he's like, unless they feel the side effects, they think there's no main effect. And I was like, I'm praying to God. I stopped feeling the side effects. It's the last thing I want to feel. And he's like, well, that makes you very different from a lot of people because if they can't feel that shit, they can't feel that toxicity, that bloat, you know, like, like (laughs) growth hormone. Guys will be like, yeah, man, like, how are your fingers? And I'm like, my fingers feel just fine. And they're like, really? And I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. And they're like, is it real growth? I'm like, yes, it's laboratory tested. It's real, (laughs) I promise. And, and you know, they're like, but what about the shit? I'm like, look, you can't, unless you just think your dealer is selling you fake shit, you can't judge effectiveness based on side effects. (laughs) And this is another reason why if you look at the forums and worse than the forums, Instagram and YouTube comments, today's modern forums, I love a bunch of guys be like, yeah, man, I fucked with Primo, but I didn't really notice anything. Fuck that. Think it's fake. And then they just stop using Primo. And also it's like (laughs) nominally more expensive. It's like 70 bucks versus 45. And they're like, yeah, man, fuck that. And you're like, you are such a fucking idiot. 
it's difficult for me to put this into words. You are looking for the it's it's like it's like if you date a girl and because she gets jealous and catty, you're like, see, she loves me. Like, wait, wait, <laughs> isn't there other ways to indicate love? Like, nah, man, I need a real clear one that's toxic so I can tell. Like, okay. <laughs> Yeah, d- dudes mistake side effects for effects all the time. Like it's it's like God, I, I see these young idiots that run trend year round, and I'm just I'm just there is a time and a place for trend. It, it yeah. does do some unique things that you can't do with other compounds, yeah. but it's not something you want to be running 365 days a year. That's that is for damn sure. Right. The, so probably the opposite is true. You probably want to run trend for as little amount as of time little, right. and with as little dosage as gets you what it is you think you need from trend. Right. It's like a box to check. It's like, how long should I have divorce proceedings with my ex-wife? Like as little as possible to get the job done. No one shows up to a divorce proceeding and puts their fucking feet on the backboard and goes, all right, I'm here. Here's my Mai Tai. <laughs> I think it's also too why these bros think that like a lot of people are lying when they say they come down to TRT and they're they're holding their size and they don't believe it. It's because the shit that they've gained from their crappy D ball cycle is not real. It's just a bunch of water and mineral retention. It's not actual real size. You know, whereas if you have real contractile tissue, if you come, it's actually hard to lose muscle. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, dude. I thought I fucking. I lost some muscle in my last prop because I overtrained. It was fucking really stupid. All my fault. And I ended up regaining some of it on the way back up through the massing phase. But then because I was overtrained, even that doesn't work. So I had to take like a few weeks off of training. I healed up. I started this current little test prep I'm in right now. It's coming to an end soon. And I quote unquote put on so much fucking muscle. Now, some of it I really did put on, but a lot of it was like muscle that just never went away from all the years before. Even though yeah. I had lost a little bit, it came back like crazy. This was real gains. But yeah, to, to your point on the whole D-ball thing, I used to read back when I was drug-free and just starting out. I used to read the forums and like, you know, line by line, try to learn as much as possible. And guys would talk about their like post-cycle results. You know, like, yeah, man, gained 16 pounds over the last 12 weeks and looks like I dropped a little bit of body fat. And I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> that's how much muscle people gain from steroids. And I realized like, that's not 16 pounds of tissue. That's probably five pounds of tissue and 16 pounds of intramuscular water. And like, I'm sorry, this is not the same thing, but those guys had no idea that they would lose a bunch of fucking weight the off cycle and a lot of these guys, you know, like off cycle, they barely train. Who knows what happens? They lose Diet most of that shit. weight. <laughs> Say that again. Diet goes to shit. Yeah. Oh yeah. Fucking no one asked, no one answered. And then, uh, after that, they get on another cycle and they have this, another crazy, like 20 pounds of muscle. And it's like, wait a minute, that's not cumulative muscle. No. They're not adding up those cycles over no. time. That's just the f- water flux they think is muscle. I don't think people really truly appreciate how much five pounds of actual contractile tissue is. I mean, grab grab five pounds of steak. That's just what I tell my clients. Grab five pounds of steak at, at yes. the gro- grocery store sometime, throw it in your cart. Now imagine adding that to your physique. It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Five pounds of muscle is no joke. Your strength will be very different. You'll look qualitatively, you know, people come back bigger and you're like, all right. But sometimes people come back so much bigger. Their shape is different. You're like, this is a different bodybuilder. Five pounds is bordering on some shit that'll sit real different with you. And yeah, gear or not, it'll take a while to gain. And, uh, I don't know but that picture is lame. I'm trying to take a substance just blows me up instantly. You got anything like that? (laughs) A lot of D ball that'll blow you up instantly. What about like two grams a week of mint? <laughs> that'll that'll do it too. If you if you if you want to end up in a hospital dead by the time <laughs> this time next year, sure. I've seen some crazy shit, man. I, I have seen some crazy shit. I I, I please I, some of, please share. Please. I saw like, I had a guy running over a gram of DHB that came to me, and I had never seen liver enzymes that high in my life, man. Whoa. Yep. Uh, so okay real quick real quick paul real quick i've taken dhb a few times honestly i love the drug unfortunately has one side effect for me that makes it totally unacceptable to take it destroys my sleep like it it makes me a lot of trend seem like a fucking sleeping baby 
And so like once you can't sleep, it actually just doesn't matter. Anything else just literally doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you're not going to be successful in body when we can't sleep. But DHB, in addition to uh, the, the sleep thing aside, is unreal, powerful. That's like the same thing as shooting f- anabolic wise. That's like four grams of test. Yeah. Yeah. We, do they at right, least get huge? I've, I've seen people. No, these these people that do this shit never are big, Mike. They <laughs> never are big. It's gym bros that do this stupid shit. Fuck. It's I I need to I need to make a video about little guys on grams on grams of gear sometime. It it's, it is the absolute most ridiculous thing to me. And the the part that just blows me away is the guys that are that are doing this shit. They come to, they come to me and they are not following a structured diet and they have nothing nothing put together for their training. I'm like, why are you doing that? It's really why? you would kind of think like if you bought a fighter plane because you were like a billionaire. You think you'd get some training in it too, in a parachute? <laughs> nah, just get me in there. I'll move the fucking stick around. It's <laughs> it, it's like the drugs are designed to enhance your diet and training effect. But if your diet and, and training aren't even thought through, what are the drugs supposed to do exactly? Now, obviously the drugs have their effect, but another way to look about it is like these drugs are a sunk cost of a, three things at least. One, health. Like, it's going to damage your health. Two, money. That shit's not free. And three, your enjoyment of life in a broad spectrum of emotions over the next 16 weeks or whatever. Come on. You don't feel feelings on tons of gear like you do when you're off season. Like, you can be like, fucking watch a family petting their dog, and I'm on trend, and I'm like, nah, shapes, colors. (laughs) I don't feel anything anymore. (laughs) Fuck, that's not a way to go, right? You have to. It's mission-oriented. you got to have reasons for it. If you're paying all those costs to be in a crap load of gear, wouldn't you feel like, well, I might as well get my diet and training in order because I'm not doing the gear for its own sake. Like, I get it. When you go to a fucking rave and you take Molly, you're doing that shit for its own sake. The Molly's fun. You could just be you and Molly in a room. Doesn't matter. Everyone's having fun. But the gear, you know, nobody takes gear for its, I don't think, for its own sake. Can you imagine? It's like, yeah, man, I love it. I'm on trend right now. I feel great. Like, no one's ever said that. So I'm sure a few fucking idiots have said it, but uh, it's one of those things where clearly the reason you're doing this to yourself is ostensibly because you want maximum muscle. And most of the guys would be like, yeah, they're great. But the diet and the training thing that can multiply your muscle, you just never bothered looking into? (laughs) It it makes zero sense, man. It's it's, it's like buying a Corvette and putting kerosene in it. I don't know why. Yes, or buying a Corvette and they're like, you need racing tires. And you're like, I'm just going to get regular tires. They're like, do you want to go fast? You're like, I'll go as fast as, a, as I push the vehicle. They're like, you're going to crash, you fucking idiot. And, and you're like, eh, will I though? <laughs> I just I just don't understand it. And uh, the, I always ask people, I'll be like, why? Why did you do this? And they never have an answer. They're, they're like, well, some bro at the gym said that this would make you huge. Yes. Oh, my fucking God, There's man. no better authority than some guy at the gym, man. Especially like that bigger guy who looks like he's been around for longer. His pimples are purple instead of red. <laughs> and you're like, that guy knows things, man. I'm going to listen <laughs> to him. <laughs> it's the same thing with the diet stuff. The diet stuff is just crazy, too. It's just nuts to me how how stupid people are with diet. What, what's some wacky stuff you've seen out in the world with dieting that like attempted bodybuilders have done? Oh man, these guys that that the anti carb cult. I never realized how big it was. It's the carnivore Jeez. and keto guys. They're just they're just bananas, man. I think I think carnivores have taken the the title of the craziest yes. craziest diet cult. I used well, to think it was <laughs> other things, but they, they have definitely taken the the, the crown. They are vegans the, are always the there somewhere fighting their <laughs> yeah. good fight. I, I think they beat the vegans at this <laughs> they point. Beat the vegan. It's really, Paul, the way you ascend to maximum cult absurdity is to eliminate the most food groups from your diet. It's like a badge of honor. And you get to look down on people. Like you watch some lady pick up milk in the grocery store, like <laughs> milk bitch what are you trying to kill yourself and she's like okay she picks up cereal like wrong again bro grains are poison she picks up vegetables you're like anti-nutrients man you're killing yourself she's like uh she reaches for like a slab of fatty beef and you're like that's it man that's the only health food you'll ever need it's like really 
this we're down to just meat that's the only thing we can eat and that's like yeah like the more you can cut out the more they're proud of it i laugh because i'll get these guys well this is what our primal ancestors ate and i'm like dude your your caveman wasn't eating ribeyes and bacon <laughs> and sticks of butter man that's not what they were fucking eating they were eating grass and sticks and berries and fucking mushrooms that were half ripe and however much meat they could fucking scavenge off the bone when they weren't fucking starving to death. also newsflash cavemen were neither healthy nor jacked I'm yeah, sorry, there is no equivalent of Ronnie Coleman in the Pleistocene era. I'm I'm sorry. Nobody liked that around. They died of twenty at twenty-five of cavities. I mean, it was <laughs> it wasn't like <laughs> forget that. Forget that part of it. I, I don't know, but it's just like there is nothing primal about it. It's it's like the Jim Bro starter pack. It's the no carb diet and in the one set per body part all out intensity. All Let's right. kill it, all bro. Right. Fine. We're on to this now. Let me let's, ask let's you a take question. some D ball. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Paul. What to what do you attribute the recent rise in exponential rise in popularity of high intensity training in Mike Menser? Because like in the last few months, because like we don't run the YouTube game at RP, you know, and we're like yeah. growing really fast and everything. It's really great. But we have a Scott, the video guy runs the channel. He does all sorts of analytics and metrics. And he sort of will recommend to me various videos to make based on what's popular. And he's like, dude, it's all Mike Menser right now. It's all Mike Menser. It's the most popular thing in the world. Oh, why? Why? I have my own ideas. I want to hear from you. What is it that is appealing to folks? I just don't understand it, man. It's I, for me, like it's everybody loves a good shortcut. Hey, I can work out less. I can do one set every 10 days and still grow. Shortcuts are, are the are the snake oil that's always sold. Whether it's with diets, it's you know the Liver King BS, all, all this other stuff. I, yeah, I don't know. And and you're, you're right. There is a, a cult of anti intellectualism going on r- right now too. So I I don't yeah. I, I don't I'm interested to hear your theories because it's perplexing to me. I think there are two as a combined one two punch for why one set to failure very infrequently is not maybe it's not always but has the potential to be popular kind of anytime the upswing occurs and here's the one two punch punch one the jab to set you up is it's not that much work and like no. you said people love a shortcut you tell me with some conviction and some quote unquote science that like the body needs 96 hours between sets to recover for the same muscle group. Hey, look like, you know, wait, hold up. All I got to do is one or two sets every like seven days. Like, uh uh-huh. And I get my best results. Uh Uh-huh. Like, well, shit, sign me up, man. I'd I'd love to believe that. Like, sign me up. If there's a competition of like religions or cults, you know, one religion's like, after this, you get to live in the hereafter. And the other religion's like, yes, just what he said. But with us, you get to be a rich guy in heaven. And the other person's like, you get your own heaven. You're like, oh, this this is starting to look up. I'm I'm going to super heaven. So if they're promising (laughs) shit, if they're promising me like, hey, like you can do one set every fucking week for muscle and you're going to grow your best. I'm tempted to fucking believe that. And that's that's the one punch. The second punch, because that one punch in a sense, d- drives home that that mega hit of it's going to be easy. It's a shortcut, but it leaves you exposed. But just the same way you throw a real punch, it leaves you exposed for a bit. That punch of very little effort for maximum results leaves you exposed to your own ego accusing you of being a pussy. Because like, oh, fucker, what the hell is this one set bullshit? You got to suffer, right? And all men know that they got to put in the work, right? It's an intuitive <laughs> thing. I had to fucking pay my dues. So then they go, aha. Uh-huh. But because it's super hardcore, all the way beyond psychotic triple drop set failure, that means it's hard. And that means not only do I get a shortcut, but also I get to do quote unquote hard shit. So I don't feel bad about myself anymore. <laughs> oh, you're hundred percent right. I never That's thought it. about the second. That's my two part hypothesis as to why Mike Menser shit's always going to be fucking bro. popular. It's intense, bro. It's a thing because you don't want to be a motherfucker that's chumped out to doing 30 sets of fucking session in the gym. Nobody got time for that. So fuck Brad Schoenfeld, you know, like fuck the goddamn (laughs) studies. I don't want to read that shit. But on the other hand, I want to be tough. So what's the easiest way to make yourself seem like you feel like a tough guy, but at the same time, not do a lot of work. One set to failure. One set, super crazy failure. After the set, you get to roll around the ground. Your buddies tap you on the ass. Like, dude, you're the fucking man. You get to Instagram it because nowadays 
Paul, how many times you scroll through somebody's shit on Instagram and you watched multiple sets of theirs being done? Nobody posts multiple sets. I put one set of each exercise up on the gram because right. I'm not, I don't have time to record myself for all the fucking sets. Sam Sulik does that. It's the only person in the world. So when you get one set to show off, why not that be your only set? You know, it's like if it's not on Instagram, <laughs> did it even cause muscle growth? So today's social media atmosphere makes it that much easier for the Mike Menser shit to go end and be a real high candidate for people that want to feel like they're doing something, but they're not really doing something. It's wild to me that want to be bodybuilders. It's like the only sport that I know of. And this just drives me nuts. Look, I know overtraining is a very real thing. I've been there. You've been there before, mm -hmm. but it's like want to be bodybuilders are like the only people in the world that think that my problem is I'm working too hard. I'm, <laughs> I need to do less. Yeah. I, like, like there's no other sport ever, it, ever where, where you, you do less to, to achieve more. I just don't fucking understand it. Like how you can even delude yourself into thinking that it's tempting. It's tempting. And the thing is, sometimes it's right, but there's limits to that shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like obviously. It, if you tell someone like, Hey, you know, you're skydiving twice a day, no reserve parachute. You don't check your gear. You're doing some dangerous stuff. Hey, that's true. But then you, someone who camps out in the fucking North Carolina wilderness with no predators bigger than a fucking Fox. And like, he comes home. You're not going to tell that guy, dude, you're, you're fucking crazy, bro. You out there all alone in that tent all these things could kill you. you're nuts man you're a fucking risk-taking animal they're like i know brother so it's like i understand that you could go over trained doing 10 sets per muscle group twice a week 20 30 40 fuck it fine but you got guys doing three sets per muscle group per session and they're like man you know what i gotta do one and you're like what and then like mike menser unfortunately as with many philosophies, a lot of that stuff got crazier the longer it went on. Yeah. So when he first started, he was like, do fewer sets and go closer to failure. I was like, dope. That's good advice. And then eventually he was like, all right, like very advanced athletes. I'm sure you've seen this before, Paul. He's yeah. like, uh, him and his acolytes were like very advanced athletes may only need to train once every two weeks for the same muscle group. Yeah. I saw that. And you're just like, what? Paul, have you ever gotten so fucked up from one work set of anything that you needed two weeks to recover no. the muscle? No, never. never. Could you imagine doing like biceps for one set and you rack the weight and your hit coach is like, that's it, man. See you in a week and a half. And you're like, but I just have the beginnings of a pump. And he's like, trust me, man, you need to recover. Like we recover from what? <laughs> we just getting started. <laughs> Talking yourself into the fact that you need more recovery when you're barely doing anything, that is an accomplishment as far as I can tell. I mean, to me, it's like going to basketball practice and shooting two free throws and saying, I'm done. Well, <laughs> See you in I two weeks. I need to stay smooth, man. Coach, I can't get tired. Fatigue doesn't sit well with me. I need, I need to give, her, give it a rest. I'm, I'm worn out. <laughs> yeah, 100%. And the thing is, like, look, like, I talk about MRV. There's definitely a top end for what your body oh, can certainly. from. Oh, certainly. But you got to find that with tri trial and error and understand that there's a big swath of territory between that and one set once a week. Well, and I somewhere asked between you, those two is where your best is going to be. It's not going to be at once a week. I ask you this too, man. You, you've, you obviously, you've worked out of commercial gyms. Oh how yeah. Many how many people at a commercial gym do you see that are actually at risk of overtraining? If I was to judge based on how they do one set, 75% of them, almost every regular person in a commercial gym goes all the way to failure and it doesn't look very impressive, but you know, like bench press, <laughs> no one does RIR, everyone's just like, ah, oh, get it off me. But it, are they consistent enough? So first of all, if you train four days a week, you're not going to get over training, give a fuck how hard you're going. If you train for an hour total, four days a week, which is like a really good commercial gym member program that's quite rare, you're not getting overtrained. Overtraining is a matter of frequency, volume, and consistency. Right. All if true. you're there AM and PM, six days a week, every week doing 10 sets per muscle group, yeah, you're in trouble. But like most people at regular commercial gyms, they're not even in the fucking ballpark. And a lot of, to be honest, man, I think a lot of bodybuilders aren't in the ballpark either. 
because there's a certain amount of mental toughness that you have to persevere through in order to overtrain long before you overtrain, you're going to start hating training and yeah. your body's not going to want to be there. And if you can fucking eye laser your way through that, you learn the title of overtrain. Most people, man, they feel remotely off. They just want to show up to the week for a gym, which isn't a terrible thing. Um, but it really prevents most people from overtraining and, and it overtraining overreaching does happen. It's of just course. incredibly rare. I remember digging myself into a hole on contest prep one time. My CNS was so fried, Mike, I could not even press two plates on the leg press. It just Holy wouldn't move. Holy shit. Yeah. I watched uh, Jared feather over diet pat this past year. Basically, him and I were experimenting. I gave him terrible advice of keep dieting. It'll be great. <laughs> and uh, he did. You know, he did. Willpower is not a problem. So Jared is now doing six plates and change and was before on hack squats for sets of 10. I watched him eat shit on 405 for eight on the hack squat during that time. Well, and I was like, he he unrack he racked it. He was like, see, because he was telling me how fucked up he was. And I was like, we gotta pull back, man. That was gnarly as fuck. And that was him on all the gear in the world. Didn't matter. Yeah, it was the same thing with me. I was at the end of prep. I remember I just it was just like it fell off the cliff one day. I just came in and it's just like nothing would fire. Like wow. nothing would fire. Like nothing worked. How long did it take you to recover? Ah, uh, weeks. It was weeks. weeks. Isn't that crazy? It's plural. Because usually yeah. most of us take a week off and they're like, I'm ready. And it's just not the case if you no, no, it, it was it was like a good month, six weeks. How did you yeah. train during that time? I just pulled back, man, and I just did very, very light pump workouts and just kind of just waited it out. You know, I was in the gym basically just doing very light pump workouts and just slowly pushed back up over that period of time. But it was it was really, really bad. It was bad. Yeah. I just went through that this past summer. It was fucking awful. First time for me, actually. Age 39. Was that at, we trained for the first time. Was that at Masters Nationals? It was right before Masters Nationals. Yeah, I was there. I saw you home. at the show. Okay. You, you didn't see much because I look like shit. Because uh, <laughs> at least, man. you know, I had the experience of like, I know what it's like to push too hard. Once you've pushed too hard, you tend to jettison all of your doubts about, am I working hard enough? You know what I mean? Because some people have like a, a thing in the back of their head is like, am I really pushing as hard as I could be? When you overtrain, that's no longer a question. You know what I mean? Yeah. We held back. My coach held me back this year. We actually pushed food back up going into the show. And I was very mindful of my training this year to not overextend myself at the end. Yeah. And, and we pulled back cardio at the end and it was the best I've ever looked. Yeah, you looked unbelievable. By the way, I don't want to all do respect to all the competitors. The judges will say what they will. But, I mean, I saw those comparisons of you for the overall, and I was like, I don't know what's going on anymore. I have no idea why this guy is. <laughs> well, the guy that won, I don't want to take anything away from him. He he had, he had looked great. And his uh, He had an incredible back. He and I have, have been chatting and talking. But everybody up there thinks they win, right? <laughs> that's, that's how it goes. Yeah, but, some people are just more correct than others. <laughs> I don't know. It was my first national show. I was very happy. I didn't oh, know what wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, no, it's the first time I've ever done it. And you're in the 45 to 49 age group? or Yeah, well, yeah, for now. And then I'll be in the 50. I'll be 50 in February. Get the fuck out, man. Yeah. Dude, I got to go in a second. But what is your secret to fucking immortality? How do I have 22 inch arms when I'm 50? God damn it. Lots of HGH. <laughs> It really does work, doesn't it? <laughs> no, actually, I just pushed the HGH up recently. I'd never done more than nine units up until up until recently. I've been playing around with the higher doses. Probably dumb at my age, but fuck it, YOLO. It's all good until cancer, and then it's not good. <laughs> it's all good until cancer. It's not good. Hey, I figure something's going to get me at some point. I might as well look jacked while I'm doing it. Might as well be on your terms, right? I caused this fucking cancer <laughs> myself, fellas. Fuck me. <laughs> Well, I know you said you had to run, man. I appreciate your time. This was awesome, man. I love the training talk. That's really, I, I wish I could talk more about training and nutrition. I kind of got pigeonholed as the PED guy, but I, that's the stuff I enjoy. The PE, sure. PEDs kind of get boring after a while. There's only so many of them. People there's only so much you're going to do and you just repeat the process. Yeah. I mean, there's only like seven or eight that people on the pro level actually use. Yeah, that's true. 
So that's it. That's it. It's nothing, nothing, nothing complex. Mike, I, I know you've been uh, pushing the app a lot lately where people can get that on the app store. Uh, it's not on the app store. So our Di RP Diet Coach is our RPI Hypertrophy app is a web app. So if you download it and then you click uh, add to home screen, it functions exactly like a regular app does. But the way you can get that app is you just go to our YouTube, click on any video and right below in the description, there's going to be a link right there. Awesome, man. I will. I think people know where to find you. They don't need me to tell them <laughs> where to find you. But well, I need to pick up the app. I still have the old RP spreadsheets. Listen, I think you're going to like the app a lot. Yeah, I would give it a up. shot. All right, bud. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate it a lot. Thanks for having me.